Okay, ready? Happy Sabbath again, brothers and sisters, as we return to our studies today. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for His guidance and His blessing? Gracious Father in Heaven, we thank You for these many studies and this time of fellowship and learning that we have had this week. We invite you to join with us now. Guide us, we pray, as we open your word. May your will be done. May your character and your name be glorified. Be with us now. May your angels attend us. May your spirit bring things to remembrance. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me, if you will, to Nehemiah chapter 8. As we were studying earlier this morning, we are given examples from Nehemiah that we are going to need to consider for the time in which we are now living. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. And the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. So if this is being dealt with on the first day of the seventh month, what is the time of the year? What feast is being observed? The Feast of Trumpets. Why are trumpets important? They give us a warning. They call the congregation together. They call us to worship. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women, and those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. In the article entitled, called to be witnesses, published in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, we read, In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning of a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, the second, and the third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are allowed, they are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. So if we are to allow nothing else to absorb, to absorb our attention except for the first, the second, and the third angel's message, Is this not something important for us to consider? The most solemn truths entrusted to mortals have been given us to proclaim to the world. Are we to proclaim a gospel of peace and safety? What is the first, second, and third angel's message? It's contained well within the first. Fear God. Give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come. And we are to worship Him. But that means we are to worship in spirit and in truth. The proclamation of these truths is to be our work. 
The world is to be warned, and God's people are to be true to the trust committed to them. They are not to engage in speculation. Neither are they to enter into business enterprises with unbelievers, for this would hinder them in their God-given work. If we are not to engage in speculation, are we to engage in specious theories? Are we to take guesswork about what's going to happen? No, no. We are to give this message a certain sound. Are we doing God-given work is the question. The answer is, from Mrs. White, is no, we are asleep. Many are in need of reconversion. Many times she makes this point. Many are in need of reconversion within the church. Many are in need of reconversion within the movement. I am charged with a message, wake up the watchman, to go forth as Christ set forth his disciples to teach the world the way of salvation. Nehemiah 8 verse 4, and Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose and behind, beside him stood Mathaniah and Shema and Ananiah and Urijah, and Hilkiah, and Messiah, on his right hand, and on his left, Pedidiah, and Mishael, and Malchiah, and Hashem, and Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Mishalem. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up of their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now it may be surprising to some that after feeding the multitude, Christ gave his disciples the direction, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. The Lord values every gift he bestows upon man and his command on this occasion to gather up the fragments that nothing might be lost demonstrated to the whole multitude the value that he places upon his blessings. Are we to take for granted any of the blessings of God? This miracle of creating the food and giving it to them was a parable enacted before their eyes. Have we ever thought of a miracle being a parable? Think about this for a minute. This was to show that the blessings imparted to them were to increase by wise handling and by impartation to others. How can we continue to learn more and more if we're not willing to share? Christ's care of the fragments is a striking evidence of his divinity. It was as essential for him to bid the disciples to gather up the fragments as it was for him to create the food to feed the multitude. He was careless in nothing. He desired to point the people to God's standard of economy in the saving of food as well as in the saving of money. There was use for it all. In the days of Nehemiah, the book of the law, long lost sight of, had at last been found. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded 
to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Nehemiah 8, 7. Also Jeshua and Bani and Sherebiah and Jamin and Akub, Shabthai, Hojiah, Messiah, Keltiah, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. In the eighth chapter of Nehemiah, we read, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Those who are making but little effort to make known the truth, in their neighborhoods and settlements nigh and afar off, are now to arise from their lethargy and to do their appointed work. The record of God's dealing with his people in the days of Nehemiah should be closely studied. How often do we closely study what's going on in the book of Nehemiah? The Lord is greatly displeased with those who, having a knowledge of the truths of his word, do not by every effort within their power seek to extend this knowledge throughout their neighborhoods and surrounding settlements. Quoting again from volume 9 of the Testimonies. In connection with the proclamation of the message to large cities, there are many kinds of work to be done by laborers with varied gifts. Some are to labor in one way, some in another. The Lord desires that the city shall be worked by the united efforts of laborers of different capabilities. All are to look to Jesus for direction not depending upon man for wisdom. This is a recurring theme. Are we to look to man for our instructions as to what's to be done? Are we to let a minister receiving a paycheck be the only outreach that goes into a community? Was Nehemiah a Levite? Was he a prophet? We just read that he was not. Yet, many today would place upon solitary individuals the obligation to try to reach out to others. All are to look to Jesus for direction, not depending upon man for wisdom, lest they are led astray. As laborers together with Jehovah, they should seek to be in harmony with one another. There should be frequent counsels and earnest wholehearted cooperation. Yet all are to look to Jesus for wisdom, not depending upon man alone for direction. How many times are we seeing dissension? Are we seeing strife within the ranks of God's believers? Yet here, we are told we are to work together. There are many that don't like this counsel. They would rather go off on their own. The Lord has given to some ministers the ability to gather and to hold large congregations. As they labor in the fear of God, their efforts will be attended by the deep movings of the Holy Spirit upon human hearts. That is a blessing but it is a blessing that comes far and few between. 
The workers are to have a solemn sense of the sacredness of the work. Often I have been instructed that every worker in his special sphere must guard every phase of his character by much prayer and watchfulness. In the early days of the message, when we began to labor in new places, we used to assemble together to relate our experiences and to unite in earnest prayer. We sought the Lord earnestly, and our hearts might be humble, sanctified by his rich grace, and that not one thread of self-exaltation should be drawn into the fabric of our daily experience. No one is above another brother or sister in this work. We are all to unite together. No longer am I to keep silent when I see those who should be leaders in the work of soul saving, neglecting God-given opportunities. <clears throat> Nehemiah 8, verse 9. And Nehemiah said, and Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. The people did not indignantly turn from God's law because they had been breaking it. They had been instructed that in the law there is life. Hence, when the requirements of the law were read, they thanked the Lord for his revelation of the sins that he condemns. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense, the explanation, and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, the governor, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites taught the people and said unto the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. They were convicted of sin and realized that they were under Jehovah's displeasure. But they had sinned ignorantly. There's one way one thing to be said about ignorant sin, it's quite different when you have to admit to sinning knowingly. There is nothing of greater necessity than for each individual to realize his accountability to Jehovah as well as his high privileges and walk not in murmuring and sorrow but in the joy of the Lord. We are to serve our Heavenly Father in the newness of life and gladness every day, knowing that we have access to the throne of grace and that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We are to be steadfast. We are to be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Then we shall realize by experience that the joy of the Lord is our strength. We are to bring in no false theories in regard to dealing with our brethren. The Lord needs men who are as firm as a rock to principle. We must have more than a pretense of righteousness. We shall meet motives and theories that cannot bear the light of close inspection. These are unsupported by a thus saith the Lord and should find no place in our work for we are to represent Jehovah's character. Speaking of Satan, Christ said, he abode not in the truth. This we find in John eight forty four. There are in every age souls of whom these words might be spoken. That is sad to see. 
Before his fall, Satan was highly exalted. His position was next to that of Christ. And he was radiant with holiness. But he swerved from his allegiance to the blessed and and only potentate. He lost his high position. He became an avowed antagonist of God and influenced others to unite with him against Jehovah. Planting the standard of rebellion, he rallied the supporters if his disaffection, that evil might become a power against Jehovah. Today, men are following in Satan's lead. All who break the law of Jehovah and teach others to do so are Satan's agents. Consider this carefully. If we break the law in one regard, we have broken the whole law. Are we then acting as Satan's agents? Satan is the root, and those who teach others to break the least of God's commandments are the branches. They are warring against the law of Jehovah, and their names are recorded in the books of heaven as associate rebels with the first great apostates. There are two great principles, only two, one of loyalty and the other of disloyalty. Which are we going to be? Under whose banner are we going to stand? We are not to linger about the tomb as though Christ were still there. We are to consider that we serve a risen Savior. We are to remember that Christ is a risen Savior. We have a living Christ. He is not lying in Joseph's new tomb. There are those who are always complaining of something in their life or in their religious service. Full of complaint, their tongues do great mischief. The Lord does not enjoy our sorrow and our tears. He would have us walk before him in obedience with grateful thanksgiving. God wants his church to be strong in his strength. We may have sorrows. We may have trials. We may have tribulations. We may have those that hate us, that cast us out. Yet we are to be strong in Jehovah's strength. There is no such thing as being strong in our own strength. Let our churches keep their souls low in the meekness and lowliness of Christ. When trial comes, do not think that some strange thing has happened to you. But hear the voice of God saying in your test and trial, This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter. In whom I am well pleased. God desires you to hear his voice amid the cloud. Who led the children of Israel out of Egypt? Christ. Where was Christ? In the cloud. It is the voice of peace and not of war, telling you to look to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of your faith, a Savior able and willing and longing to save to the uttermost all who come to God by him. He declares, I am touched with the feeling of your infirmities Hebrew four, Hebrews 4:15 God is seeking to fit us for everlasting life 
How is he seeking to do that? We are to cooperate with him by allowing the change in our character, by looking to him and looking to him alone. The occasion of reading the law to the people in the days of ancient Israel was not to be one of general sadness and gloom. It was to be regarded as a high privilege. Are we to be gloomy and sad over the fact that many brothers and sisters are choosing not to assemble? No. We have a message to give. There is a world yet to be saved. Those that will not in any way join within the work will find that the work goes on without them. Large numbers of people were very ignorant, and those who were enlightened and established themselves among the people to explain the word to them. Brothers and sisters, we're going to have many times that we're going to have to be able to explain many of the things that we are now learning. We're going to have to present these things as simply as possible. The reading of the law impressed minds and hearts, bringing to their remembrance the blessings pronounced for obedience and the denunciations for disobedience. Where do we find the blessings and the curses? Do we not see this restated in Leviticus 25 and 26? It stirred their hearts to penitential sorrow as the painful remembrance of their national sins came up before them. For their national transgression of God's holy law was plainly set before them on that occasion as the reason for their being scattered in their captivity. The people were now encouraged. They had every reason to rejoice and praise God for his great mercy. Nehemiah 8.12 And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Is not the law. Is not this protective wall of Jehovah's a reason for us to take heart and to be glad? The Lord designs that those who are brought from the darkness of sin into the marvelous light of his truth should be missionaries, bestowing upon others the spiritual blessings that they receive. Are we to all be missionaries in foreign lands? Or can can we be missionaries right in our own neighborhoods? God's gift are not entrusted to man to be wasted or used thoughtlessly or in accordance with hereditary and cultivated tendencies to do wrong. His gifts are bestowed by him to be used in such a way that he can commend his stewards as wise and faithful. How many long to hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou now into the joy of your Lord. His servants will be recorded according to their several ability. Are we all to want to have the abilities, the intelligence and the talents of another? No. We are only to improve upon the talents that we currently are given. And when we improve upon those talents, others will be bestowed. In this chapter, Nehemiah, and Ezra 
come before the people and lead them to understand that they were to celebrate the final feast that God had ordained, which we call the Feast of Tabernacles or can be called the Feast of Booths. Now, if we understand and we, and we have learned the first four feasts, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Feast of Weeks, all occurred during the initial ministry of Christ in this earth. What we call Passover, the Feast of Weeks, yes, occurred after Christ had ascended, but it was still within that week of Christ. Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement, which is now occurring, have been ongoing since 1844. Feast of Trumpets, a 10-year warning to the world from 1833 to 1843 under the ministration of Father Miller. The last feast, the feast of booths, of tabernacles, will occur in that 1,000 year period when the earth is left desolate. Young men and young women should learn the lesson that to be one with Christ is the highest honor to which they can attain. What honors are we looking for? What honors are we seeking? Are we looking to be one with Christ or are we looking to be one with the world? False shepherds are many and the Lord warned us regarding to, in regard to them. Enter ye at the straight gate, he says, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by your, their fruits." Do men gra gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Matthew seven thirteen to 20. Every youth, every person needs to cultivate decision. You need to be able to reason about what you are doing. A divided state of the will is a snare and will be the ruin of many. Be firm, else you will be left with your house or your character built upon a sandy foundation. There are those who have had the misfortune to always be on the wrong side when the Lord would have them be faithful, men and faithful women who can distinguish good from evil. In Pilgrim's Progress, there's a character called Pliable. Youth shun this character. Those represented by it are very accommodating but they are as a reed shaken by the wind. They possess no willpower. Do you possess willpower today, brothers and sisters? Mrs. White tells us, turn away from such. <clears throat> 
be as little as possible in their society. They have talents, yes. And if they were converted, they could lead others into safe paths. But they are unconverted, and therefore they are not to be trusted. Those who would keep the path cast up for the chosen of the Lord must not be swayed in matters of conscience by men who have often been zealous for the wrong. They must show moral decision and must not be afraid to be singular, to be set apart. Many are changed by every current. They wait to hear what someone else thinks. And his opinion is accepted as altogether true. If they would lean wholly upon God, they would grow strong in his strength. But they do not say to the Lord, I cannot make any decision until I know thy will. Are we in this position today where we're waiting on men to tell us what to do? Are we in this position now? Or are we in the position reflected by 1 Peter 2.9? You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We must free ourselves from the customs and bondage of society that when the principles of our faith are at stake, we shall not hesitate to show our colors, even if we are called singular for so doing. Keep the conscience tender that you may hear the faintest whisper of the voice that spake as never man spake. Let all who who would wear the yoke of Christ show an inflexible purpose to do right, because it is right. Keep the eye fixed on Jesus, inquiring at every step, is this the way of the Lord? The Lord will not leave anyone who does this to become the sport of Satan's temptations. We are not to fashion ourselves by the world's criterion or after the world's type. We are to be different from the world. We are to stand as steel, stand as a rock true to principle. God's people will hear conversations regarding the carrying out of the wrong methods and the wrong plans. Words of irreverence will be spoken. Religion will be jested about. Hear the voice of God. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Consider that Jehovah says, Ye are my witnesses. Ye are to act in my place. And for this, see Isaiah 43.10. Could the curtain be rolled back, you would see that the heavenly universe is looking with intense interest upon the one who is being tempted. Have we ever considered that in our lives? That there are those unseen that are watching everything that's going on in our lives? How differently would we have acted? How differently would we speak knowing that there are those that are right now watching what's going on. If you do not yield to the enemy, there's joy in heaven. When the first suggestion of wrong is heard, dart a prayer to heaven and then firmly resist the temptation to tamper with the principles condemned in God's word. Is there any time that is wrong for prayer? We can pray at any time, no matter what our circumstance is. The first time the temptation comes, 
meet it in such a decided manner that it will never be repeated. Turn from the one who has ventured to present wrong practices to you. Resolutely turn from the tempter, saying, Sir, I must separate from your influence, for I know that you are not walking in the footsteps of our Savior. Even though you may may not be able to speak a word to those who are working on wrong principles, leave them. Your withdrawal and your silence will do more than words. Nehemiah refused to associate with those who were untrue to principle, and he would not permit his workmen to associate with them. Think of that. Nehemiah wouldn't, and he would not let the workmen associate with them either. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Have courage to do what is right. The Lord's promise is more valuable than gold and silver to all who are doers of his word. How many of us seek for gain? And how many of us set aside the promises of God? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand, Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. Do not become imitators of men, but study your Bibles and imitate Christ. What exactly are we being told to do here? We are told to imitate Christ. Let us continue <clears throat> Nehemiah faced a lot when he came back from the court of Artaxerxes for the rebuilding of the wall. The third decree had gone forward but the work had not been completed. How many days did it take for the work to be completed once Nehemiah made his inspection? 49 days. Seven Sabbaths of weeks. 49 days. And what would we see this to be? Is it not a time similar to that of allowing the land to rest? Yet Nehemiah had many plots that were placed against him. Many people that opposed the work that was being done. Sanballat, Tobiah, and their confederates dared not openly make war against the Jews. But with increasing malice, they continued their secret efforts to perplex, to injure, and discourage them. The wall about Jerusalem was rapidly approaching completion. When it should be finished and the gates set up, these enemies of Israel could not hope to force an entrance into the city. 
Therefore, they were most eager and determined in their efforts to stop the work in, without delay. At last, they devised a plan to draw Nehemiah from his station and kill or imprison him while they had him in their power. <clears throat> they sought that if they could get Nehemiah away from the work that was being done, that they would be able to end the work. <clears throat> Pretending to desire a compromise of the opposing parties, they proposed a conference with Nehemiah and invited him to meet in a village on the plain of Ono. Now, when you look this up, this is Strong's H207. It's interesting because that means the plane of the strong. But the Spirit of God enlightening the mind of his servant enabled him to discern their real purpose. Said Nehemiah, I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Nehemiah 6.23 But these emissaries of Satan were persistent. Four times they sent messages of like import and received the same answer. How many decrees were given to rebuild the walls and the streets? Four. Four times these emissaries of Satan sought to entrap Nehemiah. Finding this plan unsuccessful, they then had resort to a more dangerous stratagem. Sanballat sent to Nehemiah a messenger bearing an open letter wherein it was written, It is reported among the heathen, and Gashamu said it, that you and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. Nehemiah 6, 6 and 7. Had the reports mentioned been actually circulated, there would have been cause for apprehension, for they would have been carried to the ears of the king, whom a slight suspicion might provoke to the severest measures. But Nehemiah was convinced that the letter was wholly false, written to arouse his fears and draw him into some snare prepared by his enemies. Do we not see this same thing today? He therefore promptly returned the answer, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. He is not ignorant of Satan's devices, and he feels assured that all these attempts are made for the purpose of weakening the hands of the builders, that their work might not be accomplished. He turns to the source of strength with the prayer, Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Are we doing the same today? Are we seeking God's strength in all that we are doing are we praising him for showing us these many symbols of his faithfulness toward us? <clears throat> Despite all the plots of enemies, open and secret, the work of building went steadfastly forward, the wall rose to its proper height, and in about two months, in 49 days after Nehemiah's arrival at Jerusalem, the holy city was girded round with its defenses and the builders could walk upon the walls and look forth upon their astonished adversaries. Did it take a long time for this to happen? Was this something that was going to go on 
irregardless of time? No. This was done properly, efficiently, and quickly to God's order. Says Nehemiah, when our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of God. Yet the striking evidence that the hand of the Lord was with Nehemiah was not sufficient to restrain discontent, rebellion, and treachery. Nehemiah, who was not a priest, who was not a prophet, was a man, yet the evidence that God was with him did not forestall the murmurings of others. Some who had been foremost in plotting mischief against the Jews and endeavoring by every possible mean to cause their ruin now professed great desire to be on friendly terms with them. What did we learn last night? What have we heard? Remember the tribe that kept saying, you didn't call us? You didn't say, come with us? in this battle yet they had been they'd been invited did they go no because they thought it was too much it was too hard they had to tax their brains they had to consider things that they had never considered before they had to look at things that were hard to understand and they set aside the work of the Lord. The whole power and policy of Satan has always been aimed at those who are zealously seeking to advance the cause and the work of God. How often did we hear and have we heard Arrows aimed at Elder Jeff. Many of those arrows didn't come just from outside, but many came from inside. Yet he pressed on. How often was he sent words of encouragement? How often did he find others that were willing to stand with him? Yet he pressed on. Though often baffled as he, as, <clears throat> though often baffled, as often renews his assaults, but it is when he works in secret that he is most to be feared. When Satan works in secret, when he works behind the scenes, when he is coming to us in ways we don't expect, then we are to watch out. The advocates of unpopular truth must expect opposition from its open enemies. This is often fierce and cruel, but it is far less dangerous than the secret enmity of those who profess to be serving God while at heart they are servants of Satan. While apparently uniting in the work of God, many are connected with his foe. And if in any way crossed in their plans or reproved of their sins, they court the favor of the enemies of truth and open to them all the plans of God's servants and the workings of this cause. Thus they place every advantage in the hands of those who use all their knowledge to hinder the work of God and injure the people. Thus these men of two minds and two purposes pretend to serve God 
and then go over the enemy and serve him as best suits their inclination. Those temptations are the most dangerous which come from the professed servants of God and from our friends. When persons who are uniting with the world yet claiming great piety and love counsel the faithful workers for God to be less zealous and more conservative, our answers must be an appeal to the word of God when they plead for union with those who have been our determined opposers we should fear and shun them as decidedly as did Nehemiah. Those who would lead away from the old landmarks to form a connection with the ungodly cannot be sent of heaven. Whatever may have been their former position, their present course needs, their present course tends to be un, to unsettle the faith of God's people. Such counselors are prompted by Satan. They are time servers. <coughs> when we are being told to set aside the old paths, when we are being told that these have been set aside because they have error, how are we to respond? If God ordained these charts, are they not as dear to us as the scripture that we hold in our hands? Yet there are many that would prefer to never see these charts again. When plied with the arguments and suggestions of such advisors, it would be well for us each to inquire, should I as a Christian, a child of God, one called to the light of the world, a preacher of righteousness, who have often, so often expressed my confidence in the truth and the way in which the Lord has led us, should I unite my influence with those who bitterly oppose the work of God? Should I as a steward of the mysteries of God, open to his worst enemies, the counsels of his people. Would not such a course embolden the wicked in their opposition to the truth of God and to his covenant keeping people? Are we seeking to keep his covenant today or are we choosing to walk in paths of man's making? Satan will work by any and every means that he can employ to discourage the active servants of God. If the shepherd can be beguiled from his duty, then the way is clear for wolves to scatter and devour the sheep. Every success of the truth discourages the enemies of God and they are sometimes focused to acknowledge that it is his work while they hate it the more on that very account. False brethren will continue to increase. Those to whom God has sent warnings and reproofs, but who, rejecting the heaven-sent message, give heed to the counsel of his enemies, are the severest trial to the faithful servants. They that forsake the law praise the wicked. Mrs. White had continued. In this rebuilding of the wall, there were many oppositions. In preparing these messages, numbers as symbols, there have been many, many oppositions. There have been those that are saying that this is time setting that it's numerology, that it's false, 
can anything from Scripture be false? Are we not to take everything from Scripture to search the Scriptures, to understand the Scriptures, and to be able to present the Scriptures? For are these not words of life? When the Jews were restored to their native land after the Babylonian captivity, they found themselves in a deplorable state of insecurity and discouragement. How How do we find ourselves today? Have there not been times that we've been discouraged with what's been going on? The walls of Jerusalem were broken down. The favor of God, their blessing and defense had been removed because of their transgressions. And there were continual rumors of threatened invasion by their enemies. At this time, God raised up a deliverer for his people in the person of Nehemiah. Was Nehemiah faithful to his charge? Was he an example for us today? Nehemiah was also a religious reformer to restore the worship of the true God and correct wrongs among the people. On account of his courage and fidelity, he was chosen of God to do this great work. Nehemiah prayed much and trusted in God to help him, yet he was a man of wise forethought and of resolute action, and he neglected no precaution that could tend to to the success of the enterprise that he had undertaken. While under his direction, the people were rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and at the same time defending themselves against their enemies. They suffered many privations. They had no courage to plant or to sow for they were sure of nothing. And the sabbatical year which God had commanded them to keep increased their difficulties by shortening their supplies. Many who had large families were unable to buy necessary food except on credit. And there was a great cry of the people and their wives against their brethren the Jews. For there were that said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore we take up corn for them, that we may eat and live. Some also there were that said, We have mortgaged our lands, our vineyards, and our houses, that we might buy corn because of the dearth. There were also that said, We have borrowed money for the king's tribute, and that upon our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants, and some of our daughters are brought into bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and our our vineyards. Now it was time for the wealthy Jews to carry out the principles of the law of God and show that they loved their neighbor as themselves. Did they do this? No. They saw that they had an opportunity to enrich themselves at the disadvantage of their neighbor and improved it. The Lord had commanded that every third year a tithe be raised for the benefit of the poor a tithe in addition to, but entirely distinct from, that given every year for the service of God. But instead of observing this law of kindness, love, and mercy, they took advantage of the necessities of the poor to charge exorbitant prices nearly double what an article was actually worth. Brothers and sisters, the covenant 
that was proclaimed on Sinai is given to us in Exodus 20 through 23. The children of Israel were commanded to follow this covenant. The children of Israel promised that they would follow this covenant. Yet it was not long after the fearful sights that they saw upon Sinai Heights that they apostatized while Moses was receiving the law they chose the path and demanded a return to Egypt today we are faced with a similar situation there are those that would prefer just to give a message of old time this is what we need to do Adventism there are those that still look to saying that we need to look for other events in the world to know where we are at that numbers and the study of dates and symbols is nothing more than numerology. The Lord knows what he is doing. Man does not know what he is doing. Are we willing to have full reliance upon the Lord or are we going to say that we desire full reliance upon man. Choose you this day whom you will serve is the challenge that is put before us all. Any comments or thoughts at this point? Any questions? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings and the many examples that you have given. We thank you for these examples that are edification for us at this time. Direct us now, be with the speakers, that will show us today words of life. Bless them, Father, I ask. Direct us now. Be with us. For we sorely need you. We need to learn how to completely rely upon you. Show us that which you would have us to do. Be with us, Father, we ask. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.